Would you take your copy of God's word and would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, for those of you that have not been a part of D-Now weekend, that has been the theme verse of the entire weekend. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Uh, Students, if you don't have a Bible, adults, if you don't have a Bible, right in front of you is a Bible. So I'm going to encourage you to take that Bible and look at it with me. Actually, if you're, if, if you're trying to figure out where is 2 Corinthians right here, let me help you with that. It's on page 1,149. So 1,149 is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. And I want you to see it. It's going to be on the screen, but I want you to see it in front of you also because I, I need some audience help. I need some audience participation. And when we get to in just a second, we're going to read that. And there are going to be uh, portions that we want to read together. And so... 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Verse 9 has been the theme verse. I just remind you, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Let me say that again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. What, what's your greatest weakness? I mean, that, that is a really hard question to answer. It's actually a question that you will be asked if you haven't already been asked. The first time I was asked what your greatest weakness was, I was the age of some of you as students. I was 16 years old. I was applying for my first part-time job. And actually my first part-time job was at Annie Ann's, the pretzel making shop. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was interesting how that happened. I was at the mall. I had two friends of mine. It was after football season. I had to find a part-time job before baseball started. And so they said, hey, we're hiring here. The next day I'm sitting there with the manager and he looked at me and he said, hey, David, what's your greatest weakness? And I really didn't know how to answer his question. In four weeks, I knew exactly how to answer his question. (laughs) My greatest weakness was making pretzels. I, I was not good at that. I was so bad at that. If you would have come to Metro Center Mall in Jackson, Mississippi, around December to January, the four-week period right there, you would have, you would have beheld the, the, the worst pretzels ever made in any answer. So they were so bad. I was not fired by the manager. I just went back up there, and I was not scheduled to work like ever again. <laughs> He, he did not look me in the eyes. He did not say, uh, God has a great plan for your life, but it is not in the Auntie Anne's uh, franchise here. He just never looked at me. I just wasn't there. Came back the next week. David Eldridge was not there. It, it worked out pretty well. About a week later, in my hometown, there's a Christian camp. They needed somebody to cut the grass and to weed eat. And I started doing that when I was in high school. And about three years later, there was a cabin counselor who was a college student. I was going to college and she walked out of cabin four and I said, I'm David. And she said, I'm Danielle. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) I kind of told that story in all two previous services and I did not get that response in any of those services. (laughs) No alls, nothing like that, nothing like that. Okay, so back to the story here. What, what is the purpose of, what's your greatest weakness? What's your greatest weakness? So you're gonna be asked that. Graduate school applications, college applications, work part-time, somebody's gonna ask you, what's your greatest weakness? I've been asked that as I've applied to be a youth pastor. I've asked that as I've applied and interviewed to be a senior pastor. What's your greatest weakness? It's hard to really answer that question. Because if you, if you really downplay your weaknesses, maybe your greatest weakness is arrogance and conceit. Maybe that's coming out. Maybe if you over-accentuate your weaknesses, that's going to show maybe she's not the best fit for this job. Maybe he's not. So you end up talking yourself out of the job. You over-accentuate your weaknesses. So most people have sort of a strategy. This is how I'm going to answer this question. I'm going to accentuate my strengths and on the backside of my strengths. So most people, when they're asked, what's your greatest weakness? I love my job way too much. You know, I work way too hard. I'm overcommitted. So that's how oftentimes people answer that question. We have a hard time. We have a hard time. It doesn't matter if you're a high school student. It doesn't matter if you're a college student. It doesn't matter if you're a senior adult. We have a hard time talking about weaknesses. We don't really even have a vocabulary because weaknesses for us seems as if we're throwing in the towel. It seems as if we're final. And it seems as if that's going to define us and confine us. But then you open up God's word 
And God's word talks about weaknesses as an invitation to know God better, to lean upon God, to actually discover in your weakness, he is sufficient. That in your weakness, in your challenges, in your struggles, it's an invitation to realize that God is sufficient. That's the theme of this weekend. It's the theme of this passage. Hey, let's stand up and let's hear the word of God. Everybody stand to your feet. We're going to read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. So as we stand to hear the word of the Lord read, when I get to verse 9, we're all going to read that together. So if you're looking at ESV, you've got what I have. You can look at the screen. When we get to verse 9, we're all going to read that out loud. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn, Paul says, was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord. Three times Paul said, hey, take this away. That it should leave me, Paul said. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Let's say that again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I... Paul will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. Then I am, this is countercultural. Then I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You may be seated. Keep the Bible open to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's walk through this passage real quickly here. Look with me in your copy of God's word. What comes before verse 7 is obviously verses 1 through 6. It's a very interesting passage here. It's actually a passage that's very perplexing. Paul is talking about in this section of scripture how he, 14 years prior to him writing this passage of scripture, he had a vision. He actually says he was called up to the third heaven and had a vision of God and the throne of God. Now, what is Paul exactly talking about here? Guess what? We don't know all the details. This is actually the only time that this is talked about. Paul, in, in a unique grammatical strategy, he actually talks about himself in the third person. So he's distancing himself and the reason that he is doing this is because in Corinth, you have all of these people that are walking around saying, I'm a teacher of God. I'm a teacher of God. And they're using the gospel to make a name for themselves. They're using the gospel to make money for themselves and their credentials. The way that they prove, hey, listen to me, listen to me, is in Corinth, they were going around and they were saying, I had this amazing revelation. I had this amazing vision. And then somebody else says, well, I'm going to top you. I had even a greater revelation. I had even a greater vision. And then somebody else comes around and says, hey, no, no, follow me. I had this great revelation. And Paul says, hold on. 14 years ago, what I experienced makes all of your stories here pale in comparison, but I'm not. I'm not going to boast in that. And this is what gets us to this passage he says, I'm going to boast in my weakness. And then he says in this passage that God has allowed a thorn in his flesh to remain. A way to think about this passage is this statement here that I want you to hear, but I also want you, as you leave here, to be able to feel the importance of this passage. Hard things in life aren't always the worst things in our lives. You know, this is what Paul's saying in this passage. That hard things in our lives aren't always the worst things in our lives. Paul's talking about this thorn in the flesh. What was the thorn in the flesh? We don't know. Again, there's a lot of things that we're curious about in the word of God, but we don't give the specificity of it. There are a lot of things that we wish we knew, but we don't know, but we don't need to know. God gives us what we need to know in the word of God. But the thorn in the flesh, the flesh is actually your skin here. 
So Paul is most likely talking about something that's not just an inconvenience. He's not just talking about an annoyance. He is talking about something that's chronic. He is talking about something that he cannot shake, that has probably followed him for months and most likely years of his lives. So scholars and preachers, they read this passage and they say, maybe it was epilepsy. Maybe so. Maybe it was poor eyesight. The others say maybe it's a speech impediment. Maybe it's a stomach disorder. We don't know the actual details, but we do know this, that oftentimes physical challenges come with emotional challenges. So Paul most likely has a physical challenge that actually leads him to anxiety and to depression also. And so this gets us to uh, real close to the Apostle Paul. Because a part of your life and my life is to have hard challenges in our life that oftentimes can make us doubt, oftentimes make us wonder, where is God? You ever have anxiety? Maybe even feel depressed at times? Maybe you feel like no one can really understand you, no one can relate to you? Well, guess what? You're in in really good company because the Apostle Paul, he has something in his life that is a hard thing in his life. And I have a feeling that some of you in this room, you've got some hard things in your life and you wonder, you know, is God with me? Has God forgotten me? Are my prayers not getting above the ceiling here? And Paul prays three times, take it away. Three times Paul says, take it away. But for whatever reason, God chooses to keep it in his life. And actually he's going to give us the reason Paul is, that he's going to keep it in his life. The Bible teaches us that God hears all of our prayers, but he doesn't always answer our prayers as we want him to do from our earthly standpoint. He hears all of our prayers. And I'm I'm really grateful that you need to know that when you pray in your life, whatever that hard thing is in your life, that you can pray for God to remove it, to take it away, for you to overcome it here. But God's gonna answer that in his wisdom. You know, our God is not a vending machine. He's not, he's not a Santa Claus wish list that we just bring our stuff to him. Every time that we hear God say from our earthly standpoint, what we think is no, it's actually God saying to us, hey, David, I've got something so much better for you. I've got something so much better for you. I've prayed, and maybe you've done this too, I've I've prayed at times, prayers, asking God to make things happen that I'm really glad that he said, David, I've got something better for you. So God doesn't say, as you wish, as you, oh, you want that? As you wish. You want to go to that school? As you wish. You want that relationship to work out? As you wish. God's not a genie in the bottle. It wasn't for the apostle Paul and he's not for you. I, when, I, when I was in high school, I vividly remember having a girlfriend and I felt just head over heels in love with her. And I remember even as a young Christian saying, God, would you make this work out? And I'm so glad God said to me, nope, I've got someone far better. And Danielle's here right now. Let's give Danielle a round of applause. No, just, just kidding, just kidding. You don't have to. We, but I'm really grateful that God knew better than I knew. So hard things in life aren't always the worst things in our lives. Hard things in our lives are always invitations to receive his best in our lives. I want you to remember this. In your life and in my life, sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers. So maybe some of you have worked really, really hard. You've practiced really, really long hours and you didn't make the team. Or maybe you're, you're working really, really hard and you didn't make the squad. And maybe for three or four years, you've worked really, really hard on the team, on the squad, but you didn't become the captain. And it's a hard thing for you. It it feels as if it's not fair for you. Or maybe some of you are here and you're students and you say, you know, school seems so easy for my friends. Maybe you've got a brother or sister and you can watch them spend about half the time that it takes you to make the same grade or maybe even a letter grade or percentage grade even below that. 
And and it's frustrating. You don't go around talking about this to everybody, but you feel it. Why why is it so much easier for them to seem to just scoot through the challenges? And for me, I feel as if it just just has me and it's gripped on to me. There's some adults here and maybe even some students here that know what it is to have chronic pain or even sickness. And those physical challenges can turn into emotional challenges. And you've prayed and you've actually gone to see doctors. But, but at, at, at this side and at this part of the journey here, God has not taken that away. Maybe you prayed for a promotion for that corner office. And God hasn't answered you in the way that you thought he should. One of the hardest lessons in life to go through hard things to realize he is enough even when we don't get what we think we deserve or even what we don't get what we're, we're striving for. Uh, sometimes we think to ourselves, I, I will be satisfied. I will, I will actually be sufficient if, and you just fill in the blank, I will actually be enough. I will actually be important. I will actually be someone if... I was about 15 pounds thinner, or if I was three inches taller, if I was just a bit more muscular, then then I'll be enough, then I will be content, then I will be sufficient here. If my GPA was just a few percentage points higher, then I would be exactly enough. If I could play the instrument just like they could play the instrument, if I could play basketball or football or baseball, I could be a cheerleader just like them. If I had a little bit more followers or as adults here, if I finally get that promotion, if I finally land that dream job, if I'm able to go on vacations, like I see other people going on vacations, if I have a house with this much square footage, then I will have enough, then life will be sufficient for me. Can, can I tell you a secret? Your enough is never enough. Our enough is never enough. That's not just me saying that. In the fifth century, there was a bishop and he lived in North Africa and his name was St. Augustine. And what was the first biography really ever published in what was called the Confessions, he has this piercing line. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. That we're always searching for more and more and we'll never be satisfied. We'll never find sufficiency until we find our identity in Christ. And so often God can use hard things in our life to strip us of the things that are holding us up, the things that we're leaning on. God can take those away and he can make us see them in a different light. Why? Because he's mean? No. Because he wants us to see us go through difficult times? No. He allows these hard things in our lives so we can see that his grace is sufficient. His strength is enough for you to lean upon him and to know him. If you've been a part of D-Now Weekend, and I know not everyone has been, but these students have seen three videos that to me have been really the highlight of of, of the worship has been amazing through music. The preaching has been amazing. It's been a fun time. But as I've seen these videos, these videos have, have stuck with me. And there's been a common theme. Maddie Hunsberger, she talked about Friday night in her video she was a wonderful swimmer, and swimming was something that, that she found a lot of success in, but it was an injury, and rehabbing out of that injury and not being able to, to do swimming as she had before, that God actually used that. And it was a difficult time, but God actually used that to show her, I'm enough for you. Mac and Bryce Harton's video was Saturday morning and getting to see them as brothers. It was fun to be able to see how they share this testimony of friend groups that change because that happens in high school. That happens in middle school. Friend groups begin to change. 
And what's really comfortable for you begins to, to shift a little bit. And Mac was talking about in that very video how, how God in the midst of those hard circumstances begins to show, hey, I am sufficient. I'm enough for you. Bryce even used this wonderful passage in Philippians chapter 1 where he talks about Paul being in prison and how God was glorified. I mean, the strangest way to talk about this, Paul's in prison, one of the worst places that he could be. This is a hard place. But how God was using even that imprisonment for the gospel to go out. And then Sam Sutton yesterday, the last video right there. Sam, thanks for that video. I mean, just leading out, talking about how, how through COVID and through his high school days, how, how God was getting his attention more and more, but he had to surrender more and more. And he comes to this place where he's surrendering to him, leaning upon him, and how God uses that as a, as a foundation for him to be a witness. And how God's using that witness to be able to bring about a, a discipleship group and to bring about a really just these wonderful relationships that God's doing in a, in, in, in a student's life. And all three of these testimonies are powerful testimonies of this passage right here. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He is enough. He is enough for each and every one of you. You have, some of you, gone through some hard things. All of us in this sanctuary will go through some hard experiences. We're going to have some thorn in the flesh experiences in our life. And we're going to come to God and say, God, take this from me, remove this. And God's going to say, I've got something better in mind. I'm going to use this hard experience in your life. I'm going to use this disappointment. I'm going to use you putting your identity in this person and this relationship and this opportunity and this school and this promotion and this job. And I'm going to get your attention. And I'm going to use this hard experience to shape you and to mold you. And I'm going to Build in you some spiritual muscles. And through the hard things, you're going to learn what it means to depend upon me. And to lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways to acknowledge him. And then you begin to see that he's directing your paths. The hard things in life are never easy, but they're not always the worst thing in your life. You know what the worst thing in your life is? Is to ignore God. You know what the worst thing in your life is? Is to think you're God. You know what the worst thing in your life is? Is to reject the grace that he gives to you from the cross. Do you know what the worst thing in your life is? Is to think, I've got it. I'm enough. I became a Christian when I was in the ninth grade. And up until that moment, I had found my identity in football, in baseball, in basketball. And I had found that if I could succeed in those sports, maybe people would like me, applaud me, pat me on the back, and say, hey, you're good enough. Still vividly remember it. Spring training, ninth grade, playing quarterback. Play the worst game of my life. Worst game. Drop back, fumble, drop back, threw some interceptions. Offensive line's coming back. David, David, what's going on? David, David, what's going on? David, David, what are you doing? You're letting us down. I just felt in that moment that Everything around me that held me up was crumbling around me. I come back to my house. Never had felt this before. Never had felt that my identity was so fragile. My sufficiency was so insufficient. And I just so happened to pull out a Bible that someone had given me at the church that I had been visiting. 
and out fell this, what's called a track, it's a pamphlet. And on the front of it, it said, got questions? And I had all kinds of questions. And as I folded it out, it folded out into the shape of a cross. And it told me, it told me that as long as I look to myself as the answer, as long as I look to myself as, as someone who lives a good enough life and could be good enough, then I would always misunderstand what the Bible says. That there was a God-shaped void in my life that I was trying to fill with sports or relationships or friends, fill in the blank. And there's only one who could fill it, and that was Jesus Christ. And there in my bedroom in 106 Elgin Place, I realized that I had a need that could only be met by the all-sufficient God. And not knowing exactly what I was getting into, I prayed and asked him to be my savior and the best words that I had. And my question to you is, do you know that he loves you? Do you know that the God of the universe loves you so much that he would send his son to live a perfect life for you, to die on the cross for my sins and your sins, the sins of your mom and dad, your grandparents, that were all sinners and all fall short of the glory of God? And then when we admit our insufficiency, we admit our sinfulness, and we turn to him as our savior, you know what his response is to each and every one of us? Welcome home, my daughter. Welcome home, my son. Have you turned to him as your savior? Have you trusted him as the only one who is all sufficient? Let us pray.